Welcome. In this short video, we're going to follow up with our introduction to the bond market by looking at a couple of examples. Specifically, we're going to look at some examples that change the bond market equilibrium. Changes in bond market equilibrium are going to happen when events shift bond supply and or bond demand. Because when those shifts happen, we're going to have new equilibrium price, which implies a new equilibrium interest rate. So changes into bond market equilibrium imply a new level of interest rates. Remember, when we're looking at the price interest rate connection, bond price and yield are inversely related. That means when bond prices fall, we're going to end up with higher interest rates in equilibrium. Conversely, if bond prices rise, we'll end up with lower interest rates. So shifts in bond supply or demand will change the equilibrium bond price which means they will change the equilibrium interest rate in the opposite direction. Let's start with our first example, looking at the impact of inflation expectations. So example one illustrates what's known as the Fisher effect, named after economist Irving Fisher who wrote about the impact of inflation expectations. So suppose we have an environment where expected inflation is 3%. And under that environment we have a bond market equilibrium, an equilibrium bond price and thus interest rate and an equilibrium quantity of bonds in the market. Consider an environment where inflation expectations are rising. So expected inflation is now 4% instead of 3%. Rise in inflation expectations are going to impact bond demand and bond supply in different ways. We could expect bond demand to decrease or shift left in this environment. Recall that the real return on bonds will decline in a higher inflation environment bondholder payments in the future are going to be worth less due to inflation. This is not really desirable to a bondholder and the bond demand curve is going to shift to the left. On the other hand, bond supply is looking at the behavior of borrowers. Under this environment we would expect bond supply to increase. The real cost of borrowing here is going to decline. So in other words, the bond supply curve, the, the borrowers are paying back payments that are worth less in real terms because of inflation well into the future. So the bond supply curve is going to shift right. So to see what happens to equilibrium, let's draw these changes on our bond market diagram. This is where we started. With higher inflation expectations, bond demand shifts left due to the lower real return. Bond supply shifts right due to the lower real cost of borrowing. We put them both together, what do we get? Well, we definitely get an a decrease in bond price bond price falls here. And if bond price falls, that means interest rate is going to rise. Quantity is a little uncertain. The way I've drawn this graph, the shift in supply and demand are about the same magnitude, so there's no change in quantity because they offset each other. If one of the shifts was larger, then equilibrium quantity would change as well. But we definitely know with each shift, the bond price falls and interest rates rise. And this gives us the Fisher effect. When expected inflation rises, nominal interest rates are going to rise. And here's a time series from 1960 to about 2012 that shows the Fisher effect in action. It shows the positive correlation between interest rates, nominal interest rates, and inflation here, as measured by the GDP implicit price deflator. Our second example is the impact of government borrowing. Again, we can begin in a certain environment that gives us an equilibrium bond price and an equilibrium quantity of bonds. If government borrowing behavior changes, this graph is going to change with a new equilibrium. Specifically, when government borrows, we have an increase in government borrowing, that's going to increase bond supply. In other words, it's going to shift the bond supply curve to the right. Why? Well, the government is going to be a big customer in terms of issuing bonds. So when they issue a substantial amount of bonds, that's enough to increase the supply of bonds for people to buy. So what happens in the bond market when they do this? Here was our original point in the bond market. The government comes in to borrow more, they're going to shift the supply curve somewhere to the right of the old one. So we have a new equilibrium, and at that new equilibrium, the bond price has fallen, which means the interest rates rise, and in this new equilibrium, the bond market gets larger with a larger quantity of bonds because the government stepped in and borrowed more. But notice the government borrowing behavior pushes the interest rate higher. 
This phenomenon is referred to as crowding out. So there's concerns when we look at government borrowing that they might crowd out private investment. Well, what's the mechanism? What do we mean by that? Well, if the government borrows large amounts, they can push the interest rates up. We just saw that in our bond market diagram. Higher interest rates are going to discourage some private investment. So some private investment projects at higher interest rates, they're not going to be feasible. The cost of financing will be too high and they won't be undertaken. Lower levels of private investment could mean lower levels of economic growth because we're not expanding our productive capacity, we're not adapting new technologies fast enough, and that could affect economic growth overall. That's the concern with government borrowing, theoretically. Is there a crowding out effect? Actual evidence in the U.S. economy with the U.S. federal government borrowing is kind of mixed. Um, for the U.S. debt, how much does the interest rate rise due to the borrowing? Well, here we have a central bank, the Federal Reserve, playing a role. The Federal Reserve buys a lot of the Treasury debt issued for their own portfolio, so that limits the rise in interest rates that would lead to the crowding out. The other issue with crowding out is how sensitive is private spending to the interest rate. The interest rate, the cost of financing, is only a small part of the decision of businesses to expand and to borrow for that expansion. So these two things really determine the extent of the crowding out effect and empirical evidence hasn't found a strong crowding out effect with respect to U.S. federal debt.